Hello, woodworkers. My name is David Hickson, and what I'd like to talk with you about today are bench planes. Just to give an overview of bench planes, their uses, the different types, and uh, some things you might do with them and my, why you might want to use them in your shop. Uh, my hope is to provide a good overview for people who are relatively new to woodworking or maybe just diving into more hand work with woodworking or maybe a few tips and bits of information that might be of, of value to uh, more experienced woodworkers as well. So we're going to walk through uh, the different styles and types of bench planes. There's a few things I will not be covering in this presentation. I will not be covering molding planes, uh, router planes, plow planes, uh, those planes that are used for joinery and other special work. I actually have a separate presentation and video on that if you're interested in, in that, but, uh, but today we're focusing on traditional bench planes. Bench planes have been around for thousands of years. There are ancient uh, Egyptian versions of these uh, in drawings and in artifacts that we, we know of. It's a very old tool and a very venerable tool, a very reliable tool, an essential part of the, uh, of the skilled woodworkers arsenal, I believe. Um, having said that, you'll see here that I have a whole range of bench planes. What you're going to find as you go, as you watch this video, is I'm going to tell you there are really only three or maybe four planes that I think are really essential for a woodworker to have. I'm a bit of a tool nut, so I tend to have multiples of things and, and kind of several different things that I, I might use or, or, I, or I might not just because I, en I enjoy, uh, enjoy tools as a as kind of a, a hobby in and of itself. But what I want to do today is just walk you through the range of tools and then focus on the things that may be of particular value to you uh, in your woodworking. Bench planes uh, in the 20th century, 19th and 20th century, we think of them as being these, these metal bodied, uh, cast metal planes. Uh, the most common manufacturer is Stanley. Stanley dominated the market for years and years and years, but there are other quality manufacturers out there from the 20th century. Uh, Miller's Falls is one example uh, of, a, of, a, of a company that uh, made many tools that were of great quality, as good or better in some ways than, than, than uh, some of the Stanley tools. Um, and then there are a couple of modern manufacturers too, uh, namely Lee Nielsen and uh, Veritas. There are a couple of other uh, lower priced manufacturers that can make decent tools also, but we're going to focus on just a few brands in this video. Bench planes uh, are uh, nowadays people commonly refer to them through the Stanley numbering system. Uh, Stanley created a numbering system for its planes that that was the specific to that brand, but other companies have either adopted it or now just woodworkers often refer to planes through that Stanley numbering system as sort of a shorthand for the different sizes and configurations and so forth. So uh, you might have a Stanley number five plane, uh, Miller's Falls, it would probably be a different number. Uh, I don't know the Miller's Falls system. Often their planes were numbered in a, in a different way, but nowadays people would just call a certain a plane of a certain size and certain dimensions a number five plane uh, because Stanley was so ubiquitous, so dominant in, in the market. So uh, the Stanley numbering system starts at number one and goes up to number eight for the traditional bench planes with number one being the smallest planes, number eight being the largest and longest planes. The number one Stanley, I don't happen to own one. A genuine uh, number one Stanley in good condition is now a real collector's item. They go for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. They don't have as much common usage in a woodworking shop because they are pretty small depending on the kind of woodworking you do. I don't happen to own a number one, um, but they're, uh, they're a sweet little plane. It's just they're, they're really pricey for a genuine Stanley plane and I, I just haven't found a use for one. I do have a number two. My number two is, uh, is a Lee Nielsen plane. I'll talk more about the different companies and so forth, but, uh, but that's, this is a number two, which is a nice size for, for, um, for detail work. Number three, number uh, four, a little larger. Number f this is actually a five and a quarter, and I'll talk about fractional size planes here in a moment. Uh, here's a Stanley number five. Here's a Lee Nielsen number five. Here's a number Stanley number six a number seven and a number eight. So you can see as the numbers get higher, the play size of the plane gets larger. Some of the other things I'll be talking about in this video briefly are scrub planes. This is a Stanley uh, scrub plane, what, what that's used for and why you might, or might need one or might not need one. Uh, I'll also be talking about low angle uh, bench planes. This is a low angle jack plane made by Veritas, uh, which I use for a few very specific things. So we'll talk about low angle jack planes. And then the other thing to understand about bench planes is 
Bench planes don't have to be made of metal. They can be made of wood. Uh, you'll notice here, this is a longer one. It's equivalent to about a number six in, in length and size. And here's one that's, uh, I think, about a number five in size. Yep, it's comparable to the, to the number five here. These are almost certainly um, craftsman-made planes, meaning they were made by some woodworker in their shop. Um, they have Stanley blades in them, but they are, are homemade planes. They can work beautifully. Uh, some people even prefer wooden body planes for, for a couple of reasons. They tend to be a little lighter for their size. They can be refurbished pretty easily. You can make them at home with a certain amount of skill or, or buy commercially made ones. Uh, wooden body planes can be wonderful to work with, just a joy to work with. Uh, here's a, an old uh, short plane. So this is roughly in size to a, a, a number four here, uh, maybe between a three and a four. Planes were traditionally wooden bodied like this and they, they can work just great. Uh, so here's an, an old example made, this one's made by the Sandusky Tool Company from Sandusky, Ohio, from the, uh, probably from the, uh, the 1800s. You'll see also planes out there that are called transitional planes. They are wooden sold planes that have a metal frame on top. I used to have a couple, I don't own any anymore, but they have, a, they have the mechanism cast in metal that's screwed on top of a wooden body. They can work fine also. They don't get a lot of respect in the woodworking world or the tool collecting world for some reason, but they work just fine. They, you know, if set up and adjusted properly like any plane, uh, those transitional planes, you can maybe find them for not a lot of money and they can work beautifully. So uh, there's no reason as a working tool that uh, transitional planes uh, should be uh, scorned in any way. They're, they, they, can, they can work wonderfully. So I want to talk now about the use of planes. Uh, planes obviously were developed uh, long before there was power machinery, and so any shaping, dimensioning of wood would be done with some combination of, of saws and, and planes, typically, uh, unless you're doing rough work where you might use an, an adze or an axe or a hatchet or something like that to shape a beam. But, but if you're doing furniture making or fine woodworking, before the advent of electricity uh, and power-driven machines, steam and steam-driven machines, uh, it was hand planes. So the hand plane would be used to get the board into rough dimensions, rough smoothness and flat dimensions and then to smooth it to exact dimensions and then to shape it to the piece that's needed. These, these were the t among the tools that were used to, to do that. So a lot of the naming for different kinds of bench planes come out of that tradition and those uses to dimension and then fine tune pieces of wood for making furniture or in architectural work or whatever. So generally you will find that the smaller number, the lower numbered planes, the smaller planes are referred to as smoothing planes. And then the, the longer ones, like a number four, number five, or sometimes a number six, you'll hear them referred to as four planes or uh, jack planes. Those terms, uh, sometimes you'll hear a distinction between those two terms, and sometimes you'll hear them used interchangeably. So four planes or, or jack planes. And then the longer planes are, you'll hear them called triplanes, or you'll hear them called jointers, uh, joining pl jointing planes, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But um, again, those terms originally referred to slightly different uses, but, uh, but the terms are now often used interchangeably. Triplane is more of a British term with a joiner being more of, a, a, of an American term, but they're, they're used interchangeably. In describing bench planes and their uses to you, I'm going to go in roughly a kind of a historical chronological order in the sense that what is the order in which a woodworker might use these planes in order to start with a piece of, of rough lumber and dimension it down to the, the size and, and uh, consistency that the woodworker wants. So I'm going to be talking about some planes here that aren't necessarily priorities for a woodworker, but I think it gives you a sense of the use uh, of, of the planes if you have an understanding of how a traditional uh, hand tool woodworker would use these, these different planes. And then you can decide what you need in your own shop and how you might use them. So for that, for that reason, that, that sort of uh, how, a, how a traditional woodworker might use these chronology, um, that's why I'm starting with the scrub plane. Probably of all the planes we're going to talk about today, this is the least likely one for you to need and own unless you really get hardcore into hand woodworking uh, and want to uh, get rid of your, uh, your planer, your, your jointer. Um, but, uh, but a scrub plane, they're, they're, they're fun to use, and it's probably the first thing that a... Uh, a uh, woodworker would take in order to start dimensioning a board. So a scrub plane, this is a Stanley number 40, 40. 
Now, scrub planes tend to be rather, rather modest in size. They're not very wide. And you'll notice here, they're even simpler than most bench planes. There's no, uh, there's no cap iron here. There's really not much in the way of an adjustment. Uh, the blade just uh, slides in and out manually by loosening the, uh, the screw here. And then uh, if you look at the blade, it tells you a lot about its use. Uh, if you can see here on the sole, it's got a, a very wide mouth on the, the sole. And then the blade you can see here has a, a, a pronounced curve to it. Uh, and that's, that's the clues to uh, the use of the scrub plane. The scrub plane would be used to take a piece of rough lumber, maybe it's twisted, maybe it's got uh, some cupping or bowing or something like that. And it's, the scrub plane is used to remove a lot of wood very quickly to get it down to a flatter, uh, less warped, less curved, less cupped shape than, uh, than, it, than the board may have started after drying. So it's a, it's a crude tool for quick, rough work, initial work in order to, to take out the worst of the defects or, or misshapen parts of a, of a board. So to demonstrate for you a little bit how a scrub plane gets used, uh, imagine that we have a piece of rough lumber here um, that is maybe it has significant cupping or it's, uh, you know, it's twisted, it's got some high corners here, and we need a flat board for making furniture. So um, uh, it, I actually don't have a good piece of wood to demonstrate this with. This wood's actually too good, too clean, but it is a scrap of white. Um, Actually, I think it's red oak, a piece of, uh, that I can use here to demonstrate. So imagine you're testing your board, you're seeing that it's not true, there's some significant um, alterations. This has a slight cup to it, but we want to uh, we want to get that out. So imagine this corner is high over here, and so we're going to take our scrub plane and we're going to work down on that high corner. Maybe the opposite corner over there is also high, and we're, we want to work that down a bit quickly so that we can then get to other uh, tools to to smooth the surface and to dimension it exactly. So scrub plane is uh, like I said, it's a very coarse tool for coarse work. And so you just get in here, just shave off those high parts. If it's cupped, you would go across the board, removing the high spots. If it were significantly cupped, we would be getting wood off the edges and leaving the middle flat here. Th this board again is a little too flat to demonstrate this well, but I think you can imagine if the board were cupped uh, that we would be working away on the edges and the middle would be uh, not touched or not touched as deeply. But notice how I'm going across the grain. Uh, woodworkers often think you have to use the, the plane with the grain. In fact, often there are many times when you don't wanna go diagonally or across the grain with a plane in order to get uh, the work done that you're trying to do. So imagine I lowered this corner, and now I can come up to here, and I can lower, lower this corner with the scrub plane. It's a very quick, very coarse, very rough tool for, for, for just initial work on a board. And you'll notice here, I'm getting these huge, thick chips here from this curved blade. It's really scraping out chunks and chunks of wood, and so it's for, it's for making a lot of progress very quickly. But you notice the surface, I think you can see this. Let me get it up to the camera. The surface that this leaves, understandably, is a very, very rough surface. Um, so you might leave that surface if this was on the back of a piece of furniture or the bottom of a drawer somewhere where it wouldn't be seen. But, uh, but that's not generally a surface you're going to want anyone to see on your, on your furniture. You've got more work to do on that. But uh, that's, the, that's the purpose of a scrub plane is to make quick work of, uh, of getting initial flattening or leveling or, or, or um, uh, removing defects in a board. After finishing with the scrub plane and getting a board roughly to shape, removing any major twists or defects and so forth, uh, the woodworker is likely to go next for a four plane or uh, sometimes called a jack plane. Uh, four plane means before, before you get to the smoothing operations. That's believed to be where the name comes from, four plane. Jack plane, it's a little less clear where that name comes from. Um, sort of some think about it being a jack of all trades. So a four plane or jack plane, typically a Stanley number five would be used as a, 
as a jack plane or maybe a number six. Jack planes are typically around 12 to 17 inches in length or so, which is the range uh, in which a, a number five and number five is around 14 inches long. So here's a, a Stanley number uh, five. Here's a Lee Nielsen number five. Um, here's the number six, which is a little long, but, but can be used for, for this purpose. Um, and then here's this uh, uh, Craftsman made one that's around that same length. So you could think of this as a jack plane or a four plane as well. One of the key differences between uh, a four plane or jack plane and a smoothing plane is partly size, but it's also how the tool is set up. A four plane or a jack plane is going to be used as the next step to, to kind of smooth and dimension lumber to the overall shape that you want it to take to take rough lumber after using a, a, a scrub plane and getting it down to uh, the dimensions that that you that you want, getting it close to the close to the final size. Whereas a, a smoothing plane is used really at the end of the work for the final surface, it's going to be, uh, it, the blade is going to be set up differently and often the mouth will be set up differently. So on a jack plane or four plane, you'll typically have a blade that has a slight camber to it um, for, uh, for, again, for moving, removing more wood a little more quickly, not as much as a, a scrub plane, but a, a little bit of a camber to it. And it'll typically have a wider mouth because you're, you're doing rougher work, you're taking bigger uh, bigger chunk. So, and then if you're using a plane like this as a smoother, it would typically have a smaller mouth. Uh, the blade would have less camber to it, less curvature, uh, almost none, maybe just a little bit at the corners to keep it from digging in um, and, uh, and use it for, for final smoothing, final work. The difference between a smoothing plane and a, and a jack plane, it's, it's partly how it's used and how it's set up, and it's also partly the size of, of the plane. So here I am with my piece of red oak again, and uh, let's say I've removed the major defects with the scrub plane, but now I want to uh, really dimension it down to the thickness that I need and remove the smaller level of defects, the, the, the rough surface left by the scrub plane, and now start to get down to a, to a smoother surface that I can start to, to work with as a board. So here I have my, uh, my number five, and I uh, have my wood firmly uh, fasten down, and I'm going to go in here and start to work with my four plane or jack plane to get this piece really down to being a usable size. Now, again, you see, I'm I'm taking a fair amount of wood with each with each stroke here. This is still fairly quick uh, work. If you if you try to do this work with a blade set up, a, a plane set up as a smoother, it, it's going to take you forever. It's going to frustrate you. It's a little bit like sanding. If you find it's taking forever to smooth something out with sandpaper, chances are you started with the wrong grit. You didn't start with a coarse enough grit, and you're just grinding away, grinding away with some, some fine sandpaper when your defects are actually much larger than that, and you need to start with a coarser grain. It's a little bit like pl that with planes, too. If you find you're just planing forever and you're not getting where you're going, you're you're probably either using the wrong plane or it's set up improperly for the work you're trying to do. If you're trying to get a board quickly down to dimension and down to a relatively smooth surface, then you want a plane that's set up to do that work, to take out big chunks quickly, you know, big shavings, rather than the fine final surface work that you would use a smoothing plane for. So uh, keep, that, keep that in mind as you're thinking about plane work, as it depends on the task you're trying to do. So I'm just trying to smooth it here and you'll see I'm taking a, a lot of wood at once in order to get this board down to a certain size or a certain surface. And I can test it with my ruler here as I go along, my straight edge, to check how is my surface going. I've got a little bit of a hump in the middle here uh, from the original board, I think, still. Yep. Um, so I've got to work in the middle here and get that down. You'll notice I'm skewing the plane as I work. So the same reason you would skew a chisel or, or any other sharp edge tool like this, you're, uh, you're changing the angle of attack in order to get, uh, get a, a better bite on the wood, deals better with imperfections with the wood and so forth. And then you can also work across the grain. If I just need to get the, the center smooth down, I can work diagonally or across the grain here to get the center of that board flattened out pretty quickly. Now that's a rough surface, but now that board is much flatter than, than it was. I've gotten rid of that hump in the middle, and now I can take a few strokes down the length of it to start to get the surface smoother. 
So again, this is this is quick work. This is this is the initial stages of getting the board to the dimensions that uh, that that you want it and down to the, the shape and size that you want. The next plane the woodworker is going to reach for is probably going to be the triplane or the or the jointer. These are the longer planes, and the advantage to the longer plane is you've got that long bed of the plane in order to ride over the high points and just shave off the high points and ride over the low points and not shave off the low points so that you can bring the high points down to match the, the low points in the plane. And the longer the blade of the plane, the flatter the surface you can get over a longer distance is what we want. Ideally, we want the, the board to be perfectly flat across the whole length. And the longer the plane we use to do that, the closer we can get to that ideal. So typically, a uh, a joiner plane that a woodworker would have would be a Stanley number seven. This is by far the most most common. So here's a Stanley number seven. Um, a number eight also works well. The number eight is a little longer, a little wider, and also a little heavier. This is quite a heavy plane uh, to be using all day long. But being a little longer and a little wider uh, can can bring the advantages that a larger plane can can bring um, if you're if you're comfortable using it. You can also use a number six as a smoother. Number six is kind of a transition between a, a, a jack or a long smoothing plane and, and, a, and a, a trying plane or, or joiner plane. It can work just fine. Again, it's quite a, quite a long plane here, so uh, you can get nice smooth boards with this. In fact, I take this number six with me when I go on the road to, in order to fit it into my traveling toolbox when I'm going, taking a woodworking class or maybe I'm going to a a uh, woodworking event where I'm doing a demonstration or something like that. If I want to have a longer plane with me, I'll take this number six that fits more easily into my, my, my toolbox rather than a number seven or number eight that just starts to get unwieldy. Uh, I either need a separate box or I have to carry it separately, which means it's prone to damage or whatever. So, so the number six is kind of a handy size for that reason. Otherwise, there's no reason not to use a number seven or number eight to get the advantage of that longer length. So here we are with our triplane or, or, or um, joiner plane uh, working on uh, our piece of red oak here. Again, this idea of a longer plane, think of it kind of like averaging. If you're, if you're going over the length of the entire board, you, you want the whole board flat over the entire length. And the longer the plane, you're sort of averaging over a longer distance, which means you're, you're going to end up with a smoother board, a flatter board over the in, entire length using a longer plane. So that's the, that's the whole point of the longer plane. So uh, at this point, the plane is set up to take not a really aggressive cut. We're still working getting a rough piece of lumber down to dimension and down to the shape that we want, flat surfaces, nice perpendicular edges and so forth. So, so we're, still, we're still working on dimensioning the board, but we're getting down to a finer and finer level of work. And so our blade is going to be set a little less deep. The, the mouth typically on a, on a uh, triplane or a uh, joiner is going to be a smaller mouth than on, uh, than on a jack plane. Uh, and so here we go. Uh, we're going to be working on our board. And again, a skewing of the, of the plane is, is, uh, is good, can be helpful. Get this cutting here. So now I'm working away on the wood. I'm averaging the surface over the entire length of the plane. And so I can end up with a very smooth, uh, flat board doing this with a little skill, checking with the straight edge as I go to see how I'm doing. Uh, I might be working down to a line that I have on either side in order to, uh, to make sure that my board is, is uh, the same dimension across its width. I can work across the grain if I have a particular defect that I'm trying to remove. Go both directions. Again, we're averaging over the width of the board as well as the length of the board and get our board down to a nice smooth, nice smooth shape. And our surface starts to improve here too. This is now starting to get close to a usable, usable surface uh, for, for our board, depending on how the, how the plane is set up. We're also gonna be using our bench planes on the edge of the board in order to get that nice and square, and again, to get our, uh, our edges nice and square. So for that, we're gonna want a, uh, a combination square or a square of some sort to be able to check our, our size. We might start with our, our jack plane in order to get this most of the way down where we need it. So 
they got just a little more in the middle I haven't removed, been able to get to yet. So, uh, there we go. Now I've covered the whole board. We'll check our sits just a little, a little tilted this way. So I'll come in, I'll tilt my plane up like this. Let me get that down. Pretty close to perpendicular. That's a little better. Now um, I'm going to take advantage of the triplane or the joiner in order to get this truly straight across the entire length of the board. So we get a nice, as close to a perfectly flat surface as possible. That's looking pretty good. Let me share a quick tip here about making your planing uh, easier on you. Planes, uh, they're, they're a lot of work. It's part of the fun of them actually is that, that it's really physical work. You're, you're putting your own physical effort into, into your woodworking. It's part of why I enjoy hand tool working. On the other hand, no, nobody likes to sweat for no good reason. So what I do with my planes, uh, and I know many woodworkers do this or some variation on this, They'll, uh, they'll wax the bottom of their planes or something. But what I use is just beeswax. I bought uh, on eBay, I went on eBay and bought these chunks of beeswax from a vendor. Gosh, it must be eight, 10 years ago that I, that I bought four of these chunks of beeswax. And um, after eight or 10 years, this is the first piece that I bought. And you can see how much of it I still have left here of the four. So I think my four pieces is probably gonna be a lifetime supply of beeswax. But the way you're gonna use the beeswax is you're gonna take the sole of your plane and you're just going to um, just rub a little beeswax on it, just like this. You don't have to go hog wild. You don't have to cover the whole surface. But by doing that, you'll find that your plane will slide along much more easily. And you can get good shavings uh, off the plane with much less effort. If you're starting to have to work really hard at planing and it just keeps grabbing the wood, try, try beeswax or some other sort of lubricant that's not going to interfere with any finishes uh, like, like this, and you'll find it makes using of, uh, of planes much easier. And this is true not just for bench planes, but also for joinery planes. Uh, you know, shoulder planes, rabbiting planes, uh, plow planes, whatever. Uh, on a plow plane, a little uh, beeswax on the skate uh, and on the fence that's rubbing along the, the side of the wood uh, makes the planing far easier, far more enjoyable. You get better control and so forth. So use, use some sort of a lubricant. While we're talking about the bottoms of planes, in addition to using wax or some other kind of uh, lubricant on the sole of the plane, I just want to mention something you're going to see about different bench planes. Traditionally, bench planes and most bench planes you're going to see have a, have a flat sole like this, just uh, close to perfectly flat across the, uh, the entire length of the sole. But some planes you're going to find uh, on the used market, some planes you will find have a corrugated bottom on them. The idea behind the corrugated bottom is that it was supposed to reduce friction. Supposedly, this would cause less sort of a sticking or suction of the, of the sole of the plane onto the surface and make it easier, make it easier to plane. To be honest with you, I've found no difference in my own woodworking, whether it has a corrugated bottom or not. It, I don't find that it sticks any more or less. And I find that I use uh, beeswax on the bottom of the corrugated sole just as much as I do on the flat sole. So if you find a corrugated sole, in my opinion, other people may have different opinions and different experiences. But in my opinion, the corrugated sole is just not a factor one way or the other. It's fine if it has it. It's fine if it doesn't have it. It's not really going to affect your woodworking. The only thing I might say is the corrugations tan can tend to accumulate wax and therefore a little bit of sawdust in the in the grooves over time. I've never found it to be a problem, but I suppose if it builds up enough, you could find that an issue and you'd have to go in and with a, a brass brush or something and, and clean that out periodically. But but again, I in my woodworking, I've, I found that a corrugated sole is neither an advantage nor a disadvantage uh, in, in the use of the tool. 
In my shop, I use a mix of hand tools and power tools. Usually I'm using the power tools to do the rough dimensioning of the lumber. I use a planer and a joiner to get my boards where I want them to be. I don't do a lot of hand planing for just sheer dimensioning of wood or for that sort of rough work. Um, but I do use a lot of hand planes near the end of a project. Uh, and I want to show you one example of how I use my, my joiner. This is my, by far my most common use of my, my uh, joiner plane in, in my shop. So imagine I'm doing a, a creating a panel. I'm doing a panel glue up. We know when we do a panel glue up, we want our pieces of wood to match up exactly perfectly uh, as we get ready to glue them and, and clamp them uh, in order to get a nice uh, smooth panel. In order to get that nice tight joint, you'll notice here on my boards, I have my, uh, my cabinet maker's triangle on here to show the order of my boards. Uh, this is especially important if you're going for several boards in a glue up, you want to be able to get them in the right order after you've, you've prepped them in order to do the gluing and clamping. So, so that's what my triangle is going to show. I'll be able to get those right back where I want them. Uh, but as you know, with, with boards, uh, you can never get them uh, perfectly straight, for, at least for very long, because with changes in humidity and releases of uh, tension in the middle of the board and so forth, um, the boards are going to move around on you. Uh, even, you know, you get them perfectly flat one day, you come back the next day and, and they're slightly cupped or skewed or twisted or something like that or uh, bowed. Um, that's just the nature of a live material like, like wood. So uh, when I'm getting ready to do a panel glue up, one of the things I do is I want to get that joint nice and tight. I don't know how well this shows up on the camera, but there's actually uh, a bit of a gap in the middle. These boards do not sit exactly flush with each other. Not certainly not good enough for a for a panel glue up uh, by my standards. So here's a, a technique for getting those uh, perfectly flat, matching just perfectly. Uh, if you if you do this right, it's it's a, it's a wonderful thing. What you're going to do is you're going to take a, a pair of boards that are going to be joined together, and you're going to Put them side by side by opening up the joint this way. You don't want to do it in some other way. You want to, you want to do it by opening the, the uh, joint like a hinge. And then you're going to clamp the boards into a vise uh, in order to, uh, to use the jointer plane on them. So here I am putting it in my bench vise. If I had longer boards like a tabletop, uh, I'd have uh, a support down at the end, a bench jack or something to support the the full length of the board, but for these short boards, I can just do it right here in my bench vise. And you want to get them as close as possible to uh, to exactly flush with each other. They won't match up perfectly because that's why we're planing them, to make them match up perfectly, but you want to get them as close as possible here so you're planing away as little of the wood uh, as, as you need. Put them down nice and tight, and then you're going to joint across the ends of these two boards. This is where I really like my number eight, my big plane. Uh, it's nice and wide. It's wider than a number seven. It's longer than number seven. So I get that uh, averaging of the surface over a much longer distance. And it doesn't take very long, so the, the sheer mass of the, of the plane is, is not an issue for this kind of work because I'm not doing this all day long, typically. So here I am. I have the, my board set up. Pay attention to your grain. You may want to go one way or another in order to get, uh, to get the, the best surface. But I'm going to start in here with my plane, and I'm going to take little shavings. It's set very thin in order to get these two boards exactly flat and meshed with each other. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for that last stroke that gets me all the way across both boards their entire length. And in fact, I think I just did it there with these. They were, they were pretty close. So I have two shavings that are pretty much the full width of the board. Uh, I might take one more, it's a little ragged on that edge there, but that went the full length of both boards and that's, that's what I want. So let's do one more shaving here. Notice with a little lubricant, I can go quite slow. You don't have to, you don't have to do this uh, fast here. So here we go, I have, I have a shaving now where the entire width of both boards uh, have, has been covered by the plane. Now, one of the nice things about this technique is you're just taking a few strokes to clean this up. You get that beautiful, smooth, plain surface that will glue up just wonderfully. They're exactly uh, in line with each other. And you don't have to worry about the angle this way. That's the beauty of doing this method is 
that, that as you put these together now, if those boards are at 89 degrees instead of 90 degrees to each other, it doesn't matter because they match up and once the tabletop is together, who cares whether there's you know a, a, a half a degree or something uh, difference uh, in, in, in that angle from being perfectly perpendicular. And with a panel glue up, what we want is we want to get those perfectly mating surfaces at whatever angle they are, and so that's what this technique does. And so I don't know how well this shows up on the camera, but now those two boards mesh against each other just beautifully tight. There's just a nice tight joint all the way across uh, the length of, uh, of both of those boards. Now I can go glue those up with confidence and have a nice tight joint. The last plane that a woodworker will use on their, on their boards, it will be a smoothing plane, and that's where the name comes from. It's really to provide the final uh, surface on, on the wood, not even really for dimensioning, it should be right down pretty close to the final dimension, but to get that final surface onto the board uh, that if done right with a plane that's set up properly is even better than a sanded surface. You know, traditionally woodworkers, they either didn't have access to sandpaper or they didn't use very much of it um, because, uh, because they would find that their planes and their cabinet scrapers would leave a surface that was good or better than you can achieve with, with sandpaper. Smoothing planes are the smallest bench planes like these here. Here's a number two, number three, and a number four. The difference in the use of these depends on the size of the piece of wood or the nature of the piece of wood. The purpose of a smoothing plane is that it's not supposed to dimension the board or to get it flat. It's supposed to leave the final surface on the board. And if there's a slight imperfection in the board, you know, a, a, a slight a curve or cup to the board or a little bit of a low spot once the board is mostly to the shape it needs to be. The woodworker usually traditionally is not concerned about those very slight imperfections. They weren't seeking mathematical per, uh, perfection. They were seeking perfection to how the piece simply looked. And to our naked eye, you know, a deviation in the flatness of the surface of a couple of thousandths of an inch Nobody cares. Nobody's going to notice or anything. And so what the smoother is to do is to get the whole surface smooth, including any slight variations there may be in the in the surface of the board. So that's where the shorter plane comes in in handy, that it can ride in and out of those slight imperfections left from the hand dimensioning of, of the wood and leave a smooth surface across the entire board, even with those slight, you know, maybe a slight waviness over many inches of the of the board. With a smaller piece, you tend to use a smaller plane to get into smaller deviations. For more furniture size pieces of wood, you might use a, uh, a number three or a number four for, for, for that work, typically. Uh, so here we have a, uh, a smoother uh, number four set up, and so we're going to go into our board. It's set up to take a very fine cut, and it's set to just go in here and do a final smoothing of the surface, getting it ready for finishing. So if you're using it as a smoother, you want it set up to take extremely fine shavings, you know, just a, a thousand of an inch, a couple thousand of an inch at the most. You want those, those paper thin, almost see-through shavings when you get to the point of using a, a smoother, and that will leave a beautiful surface on your wood that's ready for finish. No, no sanding needed. In my shop, one of the things I will typically use a small smoothing plane for, a smoothing plane in general, but in particular I like the small ones, is for uh, dovetail drawer type work. So here I have a, a, a board set up. It's not a full drawer. It's actually a, a practice piece or a demo piece for uh, half line dovetails, but it'll demonstrate the purpose here. So I have, a, I have the two tails and three pins here for a dovetail joint, perhaps at the front or the back of a drawer. And invariably, if you're hand cutting dovetails or even machine cut dove, dovetails, um, you will end up after gluing the drawer together, you'll end up with uh, a joint that's not 100% perfectly smooth here. And this is where the smoothing plane uh, comes in handy. I really like my Lee Nielsen number two for this work. I like the small size. Uh, number three or number four, again, set up properly for fine shavings, can work just as fine. So here we go with the small planes. You're going to kind of wrap your hand around the whole thing here uh, rather than trying to get your hands in to the tote. Uh, with my big ham hands here, I, I can't really get a good comfortable grip there, so I just grab the whole thing. And again, to get that nice angle of the blade to lower the attack angle of the blade, skewing the plane helps. 
um, and they just come in here and just start to smooth off this, this joint. Leaves me a nice smooth joint. You can use a block plane for this as well, and sometimes I use a block plane. It, it, it works well, but um, again, the larger surface, uh, longer uh, body length of the, of the bench plane can actually give you better results. The other thing I'll use a bench plane for, a uh, smoothing plane for drawers, is to dimension the drawer. Typically, I will make the drawer exactly the same size as my opening in my cabinet, and then I will plane it down top and bottom in order to get the uh, get the dimensions of the drawer exactly right to get that perfect uh, ideally a piston fit for the drawer uh, in the in the cabinet so so I build it a little tight and then I plane it down to to fine tune it to exactly the size that I want also with drawer work you're often concerned about getting the top of the drawer smooth at the corner where the joints are to get a nice smooth joint there but also dimensioning the drawer in terms of its height to fit it. So this is again where a, uh, a smoothing plane comes in handy. Being careful of your attack angle so you don't uh, cause blowout on the edge of your board here. You can come in with the smoothing plane and smooth out the top of your drawer, dimension it, smooth out that joint. You can even work around the corner like that with the plane in order to get that drawer edge and, and joint just right. I'd like to share some information with you about the parts of a plane, uh, why you need to be familiar with them and what are some particular things to pay attention to, and also some opinions I have about different planes, different styles and so forth. So this is going to be a mix of fact and opinion here, uh, just to warn you uh, up, up front. So I have here a uh, low angle jack plane made by Veritas. We'll talk about low angle planes. I have a number five here. This is a Lee Nielsen number five. And I have a, a, a five and a quarter uh, size Stanley. Uh, the quarter uh, size planes were uh, made a little smaller than the basic plane. So a five and a quarter is actually smaller than a number five and typically a little narrower. Uh, it was designed to fill a gap between the four and five. Uh, and then a five and a half would be what more what you would expect and that at a five and a half is something between a five and a six so it's it's wider and longer than a five but it's shorter uh and uh than a number than a number six uh you know stanley was a great company for marketing they were in the business to sell planes so they were they were not in the business of woodworking. They were in the business of marketing and selling planes. And so if they thought there was a market out there for a plane that was slightly different what they were already offering, they would develop that plane. They would put it on the market and, uh, and, and try to make a go of it with that model. So you see all kinds of planes in between numbers, fractions, and things as Stanley was trying to just capture as much market as possible from their planes. Anyway, so back to talking about the, the, the parts of a plane. Uh, first of all, we have uh, we have the body of the plane or the bed of the plane um, is the is the cast metal part or it might be wood for a wooden plane. The the flat bottom of the sole, the working surface of the of the plane or the, what I call with my students the control surface of the tool uh, is is called the uh, the sole of the plane. In the back, we have the tote where you're going to uh, hold the plane with one hand. And we have the knob up front for grabbing the plane, uh, typically. Some smaller planes, you'll put your hand around, or you might, with a smaller plane, you might put a finger up here uh, on the plane. If the toad is not big enough for your whole hand, that's fine. Uh, but on a bigger plane, you, you might put your whole hand around the, the toad. Some people like to put up a finger up there uh, with any size plane. That's fine. Whatever, whatever works, whatever's comfortable is, is okay. The adjustable and working parts of the plane here, we have the the cap or the lever cap here, uh, typically this is uh, with a uh, Stanley style plane. This comes up uh, out like this, lifting up the cap, allows you to get to the blade. We have our blade and we have the chip breaker for a bevel down plane, which is what a traditional plane is. The bevel of the blade is facing downward in its operating position. You also have uh, typically a chip breaker here, a second piece of metal that comes up very close to the edge so that as you're taking that slice, it, it forces those chips uh, or shavings up and forces them to curl and break the fibers instead of having things split. So part of getting a good cut is having this 
this chip breaker on the blade and also down very close to the edge of a sixteenth or actually more like a thirty-second of an inch or a millimeter uh, from the edge of the blade or even a little less in order to get that nice curl the, uh, to the shavings. Then we have the frog, which is the, this part that the blade rests on. Um, and uh, on Stanley style uh, planes, this frog is movable and adjustable. There are screws in the back here in order to adjust the plane. We have our adjustment knob here. We have our lever for setting the tilt of the blade side to side. Those are the major parts of the, of the, blade, of the plane that you need to, to be aware of. A word about uh, frogs and frog angles here. On the Lee Nielsen, Lee Nielsen uh, has, has copied and improved on a lot of the Stanley designs. So they look very similar. They made some, some incremental improvements in it. What, what Lee Nielsen typically does is they copy the bedrock style of Stanley planes rather than the newer uh, style of planes. And you'll notice that the uh, change in the shape here. Bedrock planes have a flat section here. Uh, Stanley bedrock planes as well as Lee Nielsen planes will have this flat section, whereas the newer style uh, Stanley planes will have this, this continuous curve here. That's not the only difference, though. The bedrock planes tended to be a little bit bit different in their casting. They were often slightly heavier in their castings. But the other key difference is they were different in the way the frog attached and adjusted. So you'll notice in here, I don't know how well you can see on the camera, but there are actually two screws on the sides for adjusting the frog and a locking screw in the middle there on a bedrock style plane, as opposed to the newer style planes where there's just, uh, there's just one screw in here that works more like a kind of a clamping mechanism for adjusting the frog. So this was probably cheaper and faster to make, but it does not adjust as well. It's not as easy to adjust and not as, uh, as steady as the bedrock style. So I applaud Lee Nielsen for going for the less common, but more effective and probably more expensive to manufacture bed style frog design, which gives you uh, a, um, a, better, uh, a better design. With the more common design here, you actually have to take the blade out, you have to loosen these two screws here, and then adjust the frog back and forth this way, whereas on the bedrock style, you can just loosen the screws here without taking the blade out at all, leaving the blade in place where in its, in its operating position, and adjust the frog very quickly with the center screw. So it's a superior design from that standpoint, but as I said, probably more expensive to, to manufacture. It's one of the things you're paying for with the bedrock style plane, and the Lee Nielsen's, it's one of the reasons they're, they're costly is they have not made compromises like that. Okay, so there's parts of our plane. If you go to a low angle bench plane, similar but a simpler design. Uh, this Veritas plane, you'll notice here, uh, we have our tote and our knob, we have the, uh, the bed of the plane, and we have the, uh, the sole of the plane, but inside the plane is actually a simpler, uh, simpler mechanism. We loosen our screw here to get our cap out of the way. And then we have just a blade. There's no, there's no chip breaker in here with the bevel up plane. A low angle plane is going to be a bevel up plane. You'll notice the bevel of the blade is facing upward. And so that's one of the key differences in the design. It's what allows it to get to a lower angle is that bevel up design. But because it's bevel up, it kind of has a built in chip breaker. The chip comes up and then curls up because of the bevel angle, and so it does not need a separate, a separate chip breaker. Uh, the Veritas uh, style planes have this Norris style uh, depth uh, blade depth adjuster, so uh, it has a, 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 a knob here with a, uh, a uh, hole in the blade that the, uh, that the, uh, the adjuster fits into. And also the Norris style, the uh, lateral adjustment on this is, the, and the knob are all built into one, one mechanism. So as I, as I move the knob back and forth, it's also adjusting the angle of the blade. And that's what I understand to be more of the British Norris, Norris style uh, adjuster, uh, where those two features are co uh, combined into, into one mechanism. The other thing I'll mention on this low angle jack plane by Veritas, it also has a set screw on each side. There's one on this side here 
and there's one on this side over here that come up and touch against this, the, uh, the sides of the blade close to the bevel. And that allows us to center and, uh, and hold more firmly and precisely in place the, uh, the blade there. Um, um, typical bench planes, uh, traditional bench planes do not need or have that feature. The blade can kind of move around in there and you lock it down with the, with the, uh, with the cap. But, uh, but that's one of the nice features of this Veritas plane is it has those screw adjustments. Um, I don't own the uh, Lee Nielsen variation or the older um, uh, Stanley versions of a low angle jack plane. So I don't actually know if they have this feature as well. They, they may have it as well. Um, one of you probably knows the answer to that more than I do. It's a good idea now and then to take your bench planes apart and just clean out the debris that tends to collect in here. Uh, it doesn't show up real well on the camera, but there's, there's a lot of sawdust and stuff that gets in here. You know, with the beeswax that I use to lubricate, some of that will get in there and cause dust to, to stick on the plane maybe a little more than it might otherwise. So it's good to get in there, blow that out. Um, and uh, I have a brush here. It's a Lee Nielsen brush. Um, but any old brush will do just perfectly fine uh, to get in there and get uh, get the crud and the crap out of your blade every now and then just to keep it keep it working nice and nice and smooth. So now that we've got our uh, blade uh, our plane cleaned out a little bit, let's go ahead and put it back together. Um, so we put our blade in. The blade will ride uh, in a notch there. Uh, the uh, that little tongue on the uh, on the blade adjustment fits into the. Uh, that slot on the, on the chip breaker there. And we put our lever cap on. Our lever cap should fit nice and tightly. Things not going together here. There we go. Put our lever cap in. Lock that down. It should fasten down snugly, but not so tight that you really have to force it and start to push things out of shape. You adjust the tension of that with the cap screw here. You screw it in, in a little bit to tighten this all up or, or back it out to loosen it up a little bit. So you want it to be nice and snug, but it doesn't have to be Superman tight, just enough to keep things from moving around. I'll also take time here to talk a little bit about blades. The original blades that came with Stanley planes work fine. Uh, there's no real compelling reason to change them. But I have to tell you, I have, uh, I have changed out the blades in all of my common Stanley planes that I use on a regular basis. I've gotten aftermarket blades. The ones I like happen to be made by, the, by uh, Hock, H-O-C-K, Hock blades. They, they are thicker, uh, and the uh, chip breaker is a, a thicker metal and a slightly different design so that it fits well into the, into the plane. I find that the thicker blade chatters less, it's easier to adjust, it's easier to get good clean shavings with. It's good quality steel that sharpens well, holds an edge very well. Uh, so I, I think it's worth the extra money uh, if with a plane that you're using regularly to get a good quality aftermarket blade uh, for, your, for your plane as, as I've done with some of mine. Again, the original standing blades can, can work fine. If you do the work to adjust things and to, to get the plane set up correctly, that would be a different video to walk through the whole process of setting up a, a bench plane. And there are many good videos already on the internet available on how to, how to do fine tuning and setting up a, a bench plane. But, but just to mention here that I've, I've invested in good quality Hawk blades for my uh, commonly used bench planes, because I, I, uh, Stanley planes, because I think they're worthwhile. The Liam Nielsen's already come, and the Veritas planes already come with a very high quality blade and chip breaker. So you're, you're all set there. That's part of what you're paying for with those, with those planes. Let's talk a little bit about bed angles. On a traditional uh, bench plane, the, the bed angle or the angle at which the blade is being held is commonly 45 degrees. 45 degrees is, is a compromise. It's sort of an average angle that works well under most situations. And so the vast majority of, of traditional bench planes you will find out there will have a bed at 45 degrees. And this Lee Nielsen has its bed angle at 45 degrees. You will find bench planes out there, traditional bench planes, that have bed angles that are higher degrees, 50 degrees, 55 degrees, even up to 60 degrees, a steeper angle to the blade. 
The reason for that is that a steeper angle will often give better results and result in less tear out on a highly figured woods like uh, exotic uh, tropical woods or just a highly figured grain, bird's eye maple or, or uh, crotch wood or something like that. If you use a plane with a higher angle, you're, you're going to get less tear out typically with the higher angle. Well, why not use a higher angle all the time then? Well, the higher you go in the angle, the harder it is to work the plane. It takes more force to push that higher angle blade through the wood, and so therefore you're paying a penalty, you're paying a price for that higher angle, even though it works better in certain situations. So, so everything's a bit of a compromise, right? Higher angles can work better on figured grain, lower angles are a little easier to work through the wood, and so over time they found that a 45 degree angle uh, turns out to be a good compromise around all of those things. If you do a lot of wood with hard, hard uh, tropical woods or highly figured woods, it might be worth investing in a plane that has a higher bed angle. Lee Nielsen continues to sell planes with a higher angle. I believe that Stanley did also, though probably in very, very small numbers. They're probably hard to find uh, if they exist. I actually don't, don't know for sure, but I would imagine they're, they're hard to find. The other way you can go is Lee Nielsen will sell you a frog that is a higher angle, so the, 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 the body of the plane is the same, they just produce a frog with a higher angle to hold the blade at a higher angle. So you could just get one plane and, and purchase a high angle frog for it, uh, for that occasional time when you might want a higher angle plane. The thing about angles is, as you go lower and lower, you're going more towards a low angle plane, and I'll talk about low angle planes in a second here. As you go higher and higher, you're going less and less from a shaving or slicing action and more and more towards a scraping action. Well, as we know, scrapers are great for getting rid of tear out or for working highly figured wood, getting that final surface. But there are a lot of work to scrape that blade. You know, scraper is going to be at 90 degrees or even, even more than 90 degrees working across the, the, the wood with a scraper. They do great with that high figure, but it's, it's a lot of work. And you're only going to be taking the mirror shaving, you know, a fraction of a thousandth of an inch with a scraper. So, so as you get higher and higher angle, uh, you're getting less of a slicing action and more of a scraping action, which is good and bad, depending on your, on your purpose. So now let's talk about a low angle jack versus a traditional jack that say has a 45 degree angle. With a bevel down plane, and traditional bench planes are bevel down plates, the bevel of the blade is facing down towards the wood. The angle of the plane is the angle of attack on the wood. So if this is at 45 degrees, that blade surface is hitting the wood at 45 degrees. The angle of the bevel is less important. As long as it's a high enough angle to get a good clean shaving off of the wood, the, the, the angle on the back is less important for how the plane will function. A shallow angle, you might find you have a blade that doesn't wear very well because you have a very thin edge and that edge will, will um, get damaged in the not, not, uh, normal operation of the plane more easily. And if you have, if you have too high an angle on the, on the back, on the bevel on the back side of the blade, then you can run into issues with it not, it not um, biting into the wood sufficiently. But as long as you have something around a 30, 35 degree angle on the back of the blade, something more than 15 degrees, then, then the, the effect on the wood as it's making the shaving is determined by the angle of the bed and not by the angle of the bevel. So this would, this would, this tank angle is set by the angle of the of the frog, which is 45 degrees. It's different on a bevel up blade, which is what low angle planes are. They are bevel up planes. So with the bevel up, the angle of attack on the wood is a combination of the bed angle, which is going to be typically 12 to 17 degrees, and the angle of the bevel. So let's say I have a 30 degree bevel on my blade and the bevel is up here and I have a 12 degree angle on my frog or on the bed of the plane here. So the angle of attack is going to be the addition of those two angles. 12 plus 35 gives me a 47 degree attack angle. So 45 degrees on this and 47 degrees here, uh, thir again, 30, 35 plus plus 12 gives us 47, you're not really going to experience much of a difference there. 
So the way you're going to get a difference with a bevel up plane, a low angle plane, is by having a shallower angle of bevel. Maybe it's a 25 degree. So now 25 degrees on your bevel plus 12 degrees on the, on the plane. Now you've got uh, a, a 25 plus 12, 37. Now you've got a 37 degree uh, attack angle, which is significantly lower than 45. And there you start to get some of the advantages and disadvantages of a low angle, uh, low angle uh, plane. So keep that in mind. Now, one of the reasons people like low angle uh, planes like a low angle jack plane is that you can change the angle of attack simply by changing the blade. One of the reasons some people prefer the low angle jack plane as sort of their, their first purpose, per, first purchase or their all around plane is that you can vary the angle of attack of the plane by just simply changing the blade. So let's say you want a low angle blade for, uh, for one purpose and I'll talk about why you might want a low angle blade. Uh, one example is working end grain. So if you want a, a low angle uh, on the plane, you can have a blade with a, a, a very low angle uh, bevel ground on the blade, and then you have a low angle a, a, of attack. Or you can simply change out the blade for a blade that's ground with a higher angle bevel, and then you get some of the advantages of a higher attack angle uh, for working uh, figured grain and so forth. So some people think that a low angle jack plane can be kind of an all around plane by being able to just simply change the blade. I, I don't know, I just, that's not how I use my planes. I use the traditional planes, but, but you know, your, your results and preferences may, may vary. So a few things I will point out about low angle uh, Jack planes, and I, I own this one that by Veritas, and I do use it for certain things, and I'm glad I, glad I have it. Having that low angle of attack can be particularly useful for working on end grain. So if you have something where you're working end grain, that low, uh, low angle can be very advantageous to, to slice off the ends of those fibers uh, rather than mashing them with a, with, with a higher angle or just not being able to cut them very effectively. Also, low angle uh, jack planes will typically come with an adjustable mouth, so you can you can have you have additional versatility there for adjusting for a thicker cut with a bigger mouth to get a a, a rougher cut. Say you're using this to uh, to do some initial um, uh, jack plane work on on a board, so you can you can set the blade deep and set the mouth large and take out big chunks. Or if you're using it for smoothing or for end, fine end grain work, you can uh, set the blade shallow and set the mouth very, very uh, small. So, so with the uh, Veritas, for example, the, uh, the mouth is held in place with, uh, with the front knob. You just loosen the knob, and then it's got a, uh, a second knob here that you screw in and out to adjust the, uh, adjust the, uh, the mouth. And then put the mouth where you want it, tighten this back down. And, and away you go. So, so you have some versatility with the adjustable mouth here on uh, many low angle jack planes, uh, much the way you have with the adjustable mouth on some block planes as well. What I use my low angle jack plane for is in my shooting board. I don't have a separate dedicated uh, shooting board plane. They're available, they're really expensive, uh, or if you want the traditional Stanleys, they're hard to find. But I use my low angle jack plane here in a, uh, in a shooting board in order to trim end grain. So let's say I have a board here where the end isn't quite square or, uh, or I've cut on a handsaw and I want a smoother surface on it. I can use this, um, if I had it adjusted properly, I can use this to trim down my, my end grain on my board here to get a nice smooth uh, finish on my, on my, uh, on my end grain. So a uh, shooting board is something very easy to make at home in your shop. Uh, you certainly shouldn't bother going and buy a shooting board. But you can use a, a jack plane for this work, which is, which is nice. It's just another way that, uh, that adds versatility uh, to, to the jack plane. I fabricated this, uh, what's called a hot dog here. This is just a, uh, a piece of wood that's shaped. Uh, it ha mine happens to be laminated, but it, it, it can be just a solid piece of wood. And you'll see in here, Maybe on the camera, there's a set screw down in there that uh, locks it onto, uh, onto the handle. The whole point of that is just when it's being used as a shooting board, it gives you just a, something nicer to hang on to rather than the, the raw edge of the, of the, um, of the, the body of the, of the plane. So uh, that's, again, a way you can customize the, the jack plane for the particular uses that you're putting it to. You can use a, um, a, uh, a regular jack plane for this as well. It's just the higher 
angle uh, is going to make it harder to, uh, to work the end grain as all. Well. But it, it can be used the same way with the shooting board. I'd like to share a little bit of my experience with uh, acquiring planes, purchasing planes. Um, I've gotten planes from a number of different sources and so forth. A lot of the Stanleys I got, I got um, earlier when I st really started into woodworking, really got serious about it, wanted to get in more hand tool work. And uh, I went to yard sales, I went to uh, woodworking shows, tool shows, um, and I also have bought planes on eBay. Um, and uh, and I've had pretty good success with all of them, but you have to you have to know what you're looking for. You have to know when you look at a plane, are all the parts there? Um, with uh, with planes, you want to make sure that there's no uh, major defects in the casting, um, because these are cast iron. If they get dropped on the floor, they will often uh, break, uh, split, and then people will attempt to weld them um, to uh, to repair them. Some people are good at welding and can do a very effective repair and some people can't. Um, and if you're buying something on eBay and you see that it's been repaired in some way, it's, it's uh, been, been welded to repair it, I would run the other way because you have no way of telling the quality of that repair. Um, if you're able to inspect it in by hand and you can tell that the repair has been done well and the plane now functions correctly, well then, you know, maybe with an adjustment in cost, you would go for a repaired plane, but generally you want to stay away from planes that have been damaged and then repaired. You want to make sure they're complete. The older planes that have the uh, the wooden tote and wooden knob tend to be better quality. When uh, when Stanley got into uh, after World War II, they started to use more and more plastic in the planes, um, and uh, and the castings tended to be uh, thinner and inferior too. They were selling less of them, and they made them cheaper in order to just keep their sales and profits up as woodworkers move towards more uh, machinery in their woodworking. Um, so I, I generally find the pre-World War II Stanleys, not so old that they're rare collector's item and people want a million dollars for them, um, but they're they're old enough to be good quality, but new enough to not be very expensive. Um, if the handles are a little worn, the knobs a little worn, you can refinish them, you can make a new handle, you can buy a new handle. So I don't worry so much about the condition of the handles uh, unless I'm just not willing to do that work. But uh, but a good a good use Stanley plane. Um, if you shop around, you don't have to pay a lot. I think this number uh, seven here. Uh, I don't remember paying more than about fifty dollars for any of my Stanley bench planes. I bought them all used. I bought them all at a variety of different places, and I didn't pay a whole lot of money for any of them. What I did do, as I mentioned earlier, I did invest in a good quality aftermarket blade for the ones that I use well. So I, I worried less about the uh, condition of the blade when I bought it, and I just bought a good quality blade for it, which I think is better than the original blade anyway. You can go out and buy bench planes uh, 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 new. Uh, the two main companies that produce quality bench planes are Lee Nielsen and uh, Veritas. They both make wonderful planes. Uh, Lee Nielsen tends to stick a little more to the traditional format. They make incremental improvements on Stanley's original uh, Bailey plane designs. Uh, Verita Veritas tends to innovate a little bit. They use a little more aluminum in some of their fittings, not in the plane itself usually, but in some of the fittings, they will improve and, and, and sort of individualize some of their designs a little bit more. I own Veritas planes. I think they're beautiful quality planes. I own Lee Nielsen planes. I think they're beautiful quality planes. Um, if, and you know, between the two of them, a lot of it comes down to, to preference. What do you like? So go to a woodworking um, show, uh, try them both out at their, um, you know, if you go to a show where they're both there, get a sense of what you like and then go for what you like. I really believe you get what you pay for with tools. If you get a used tool, you can find some good bargains. But if you're going out there buying a new tool, um, you, you really do get what you pay for. The Lee Nielsen uh, tools are expensive. I just looked on their website. You're going to pay, uh, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars for a brand new Lee Nielsen bench uh, plane. Uh, their number eight, for example, this is number seven, but their number eight is four hundred and seventy five dollars for a brand new number eight. That's a lot of money for one tool. Um, you, you, can, you can start to build a, buy a nice drill press for that kind of money, right? Um, but I, I think they're worth it. If you're going to buy new, 
Uh, if you're going to buy used, then you're going to have to do some work to tune it up, maybe get a new blade for it, maybe replace the tote. You're going to have to do some tuning on that to get it uh, uh, working properly. You might even have to do some work to flatten the bed on it if the bed is just really in not, the uh, sole is not really in great shape. So, but if you want to go out and buy a tool that's going to be 99% of the way ready to use right out of the box and, and it's going to be a good quality, reliable tool for your lifetime and your kids' lifetimes and your grandkids' lifetimes, then you really can't go wrong with Lee Nielsen or the Verit Veritas tools. They're expensive, but you get what you pay for. And as I've said before, uh, when you buy a high quality tool, you only cry once uh, when you buy it. If you buy a cheap tool, you're going to find that you, uh, it affects the quality of your woodworking. You're going to get frustrated eventually with a poor quality tool. You're going to end up buying the better quality tool later to replace it. And so you're going to end up uh, crying every time you use it and then crying when you buy the better tool uh, for, for more money. So better to cry once and just buy a high quality tool from, from the start. So with all of this talk about bench planes, you might be wondering, uh, especially if you're relatively new to woodworking, well, what, what do I really need? What, what, what should I be buying? Uh, I think the advice I'm going to give you is pretty similar to what a lot of other woodworkers would, would tell you. Uh, if you go on YouTube, there are a lot of other videos out there about, about hand planes. I encourage you to watch not just mine, but watch other people's videos about, about hand planes to, to get other people's opinions and experiences. Um, Typically, though, the advice that's given to people is that you can start with just one or two or, or three essential planes, um, a smoother, a, uh, a jack plane, and a jointer plane. Uh, if you have those three, you can do 99% of what you would need a bench plane for. Um, so you can start there. So, so which one should you get first? Or if I can only afford one or two, which ones would I get? A lot depends on the kind of woodworking you're doing and what you want the plane for. Um, if you are doing uh, 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 the majority of woodworking using machinery, if you're doing your joinery using routers or table saw, uh, and, and you're not doing a whole lot with, uh, with hand planes or dimensioning or finishing of wood with, by hand, uh, you're using a lot of machinery to do the bulk of your work, then the one plane I might encourage you to start with, this might be a little different with what other people might say, but I might say get your, your joiner plane first. Um, I have found no method for getting panel glue-ups uh, perfectly flush to get those just nice, tight, perfect glue-up joints. I've found no way to do that better than with a, a, a joiner plane, a hand plane like this. So, so if you're doing panel glue-ups and you're doing almost everything else with power tools, maybe this is the one you start with to be able to use it and set it up and adjust it strictly for doing uh, panel, panel glue-ups. It really is, in my opinion, the best way to, do, to get panel uh, glue-up joints nice and tight. So maybe you start with that one. On the other hand, if you're starting to get into uh, cutting joinery a little bit by hand, maybe you're learning how to do hand cut dovetails or you're doing a, a lot of drawers with hand cut dovetails or even if machine based ones and you're trying to get perfect drawer fits, I would go with a small smoother. This, uh, this number uh, four is nice or even a number three would be nice for that kind of work for uh, working with, with drawers and tuning drawers and getting your dovetail joints nice and tight or your um, your uh, your through tenons, those kinds of things, you can you can do a lot of nice work with that. Block plane works nicely too, but the longer sole of a bench plane can be really nice if you're working on a typically sized drawer or large large drawer to get again that that longer length to average the the uh, the cut you're getting over a longer distance of your wood. And then you've got your jack plane, the jack of all trades. You could uh, you could get this uh, as your third plane if you're doing um, uh, doing smoothing work. Um, uh, or you're uh, starting to get into dimensioning lumber by hand, uh, then certainly a jack plane um, set up for, for, um, for as a four plane or set up as a smoother, depending on the work you're doing, uh, is probably your, your additional plane that you would get. So but this is kind of the basic set that uh, people are getting serious when they're woodworking, especially if they're starting to do more hand work. These are the ones that they're going to want to have. There are people who say that a low angle jack plane does all of those things well 
and especially if you get a couple of different blades for it, that a jack plane is truly the jack of all trades. I, I don't happen to agree with that. It hasn't been my experience. I like to have certain planes set up for certain purposes, so I'm not fussing with changing the plane. Uh, I mentioned this on my, um, my specialty plane video, that, that I'd rather have two or three different planes set up for different purposes rather than trying to do have one plane that's set up to do everything and then I'm constantly having to fuss with the settings on the blade, change out the blade, change the angle, change the, the setting to putting the hot dog on, taking the hot dog off, whatever. Um, I'd, I'd rather just have a few different planes set up uh, for their particular purposes, but that's just me. I guess the last thing I would say is that if you get into a lot of hand woodworking um, and you're doing a lot of joinery fitting, in addition to your sort of uh, number three smoother um, or number four smoother, uh, I think a smaller smoother, a number two, or if you can find them and can afford it, maybe even a number one smoother is a really nice addition to these others to have uh, for doing that finer work for smaller work. Um, I find I use this plane a lot in, in my shop. Um, so that might be an additional pur uh, um, purchase to, uh, to consider. You don't need a whole wa wall of planes the way I, I have here. It's fun to own all of the planes if you're into tools, but certainly not necessary. Basic set of two or three planes, depending on the kind of woodworking you're doing, is absolutely fine. You don't need to go out and buy every plane uh, under the sun the way some people do.